Let's worship his name today. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, and Jesus, our strong tower, our strong tower. And Jesus, and Jesus, there's no one higher, there's no one higher. Sing that with us now, Jesus. Church, we need to sing today with depth, with grit, with strength today. We've all seen the images the last few days. It's been confronting. It's been overwhelming as Russia has invaded Ukraine and we've seen tanks in these modern streets crushing cars, fighter jets up in the air above cities that could look like Denver. It's confronting children, moms trying to get out. What can we do today? What we can do today is one of the things that we are best at. We could sing today. We could sing a song of truth over the different lies that are going on. The Bible says in Psalm 42 that He, God, is our song in the night. Ukraine needs a song in the night right now. So we could enter in with them. We could stand in solidarity with them by singing a greater reality than the reality that they're facing. There is great strength in when we sing because we do not battle against flesh and blood but against the rulers and authorities and the powers of darkness. So when we sing, darkness is pushed back. And the Lord has given us a song to sing. Our God is overall, should war break out around us, should threats assault his reign, there is a truth unchanging, unmoved by anything. Our God is overall. We believe that as the church, so we can enter in today. We don't have to stand 6,000 miles away and just hope. We could stretch our hands out to that place and we, and we could say over the city streets, Jesus. Over that nation, Jesus, King Jesus. We stand upon the truth today. And we go to war for our friends, our brothers and sisters over there. We sing with strength today. Our worship rises. So God, would you come? Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Come on, church, let's sing today with a different type of faith. 
Let him hear us sing. The Lord is our light. The Lord is our light and salvation. Why should we retreat in fear? The Lord is our strength. The Lord is our strength in our weakness. So why should we betray our faith? There is a song to sing when darkest nights begin. A song of holy
break out. Should war break out around us? Should the resist soft as your rain? There is a truth unchanging.
Proverbs 18.10 says this, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they're safe. You know, I saw a picture this week of an elderly lady in Ukraine that was the perfect embodiment of this passage. As bombs are falling, gunfire in the streets, air raid sirens are going off, she hears the bells of her church and she stops and lifts her hands before the mural in front of that place and begins to pray for her country. Amazing, as her nation is being shaken to the core, she's remembering that she's a part of a kingdom and a king that can never be shaken. And she's pressing into that place. This morning, church, it is so obvious what God is inviting us into. As we've come in to worship and think about him and praise him and be reminded of how good he is, he said, yes, welcome. All right, now I want you to turn your attention and prayers toward Ukraine. So together we're gonna press in and join that sweet lady and pray over Ukraine together. Are you ready, church? We're gonna do some work this morning. If you wanna turn back towards the flag, or stretch your hand in whichever direction you think Ukraine is <laughs> and begin to pray. Father, we thank you so much right now that you are a king that cannot be shaken, that you have founded a kingdom that cannot be taken away. And as nations battle, Lord, you are sovereign over it all. We pray right now for the people of Ukraine that you would protect them. Lord, we pray for the people of Russia that you would put peace upon them. Lord, we pray that you would spare innocent lives. God, that you would cause things to happen so that people that would have normally perished in this war, they would not perish, that they would press into you and they would lean into your presence and your goodness. God, we pray for provision to be made for people that are without food or without shelter, who are cold at night. Lord, would you make a way? God, we pray for the church in Ukraine. Will you strengthen the leaders of the church in Ukraine? Lord, you cause their faith to rise. God, I pray that rather than shrink back and hide in fear, that they would stand and praise you and thank you for covering them. God, we ask that you would be the great shepherd over Ukraine, that you'd be the great protector over Ukraine. Lord, we ask boldly for peace to come to that part of the world. God, we know that you direct the heart of a king like a water course, the scripture says. And so we ask that you would speak to kings, that they would listen, that you would put a stop to rulers that are planning evil, that you bring confusion into those that are planning destruction. Lord, we pray for a miraculous turnaround in this story over Ukraine. Lord, we pray that you would intervene. God, we pray as one people asking you to move, your mighty hand would move across the situation. We pray all this in the awesome name of your son Jesus and the people of God together said, amen, amen. You know, church, I wanna thank you so much for your generosity, your faithfulness to give. It has allowed us as a church to be generous over and over and over again to people in really difficult situations. Here in a couple weeks, we're gonna be able to announce to you some new partners to help those that are fleeing the conflict in Ukraine. Right now, they estimate that about 400,000 people have had to leave their home. Imagine that, 400,000. 120,000, they estimate, have fled into Poland. And so we're gonna look for organizations that we can partner with to help them, to, to, to let them know they're not forgotten. So as you give, we can know that the Lord is gonna be, is already up to good things, right? But he's gonna be up to good things through our church to bless those in that situation. Church, let's continue to worship as we give.
Let's keep seeking, let's keep knocking, let's keep praying on behalf of our brothers, the church, our sisters, the church in Ukraine. Let's do it together, amen, church? Oh, come on, amen, church? Yeah. We've been in a series called Who Is God? Pastor Bray's gonna come and lead us today, but before we do that, why don't you turn to somebody, tell them you're glad to see them, maybe meet a new face, and then feel free to take a seat. Yeah, thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. Like three people responded back. So good morning, everybody. Uh, up to eight people now. Y'all are very warm, responsive. So good to have you today. I want to just welcome all of you that are watching online. We have tens of thousands of people that watch us locally online. We're so grateful you've joined us. And I hope you felt at home and in your apartment what we feel in this room, that there is something powerful about coming together, right? And I knew all week long as we all probably were glued to our TV stations watching the events unfold in the Ukraine. I knew this for a fact. I knew that if I could get into this room with you today, that my perspective would change. My heart would be filled, that something would shift in my mind and heart, and that's what happened. And I think of that song that we sing sometimes, you know, this is how we fight our battles. And this is, worship is warfare. Worship is joyful and a good and it's refreshing, but worship is a battle and we just declare the truth of God's reign over Ukraine. So I wanna remind you that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 7.30 in the morning and at 12 noon, all this week, we'll be praying. And in all of those prayer meetings, we will have a dedicated time in all those prayer meetings where we pray over the people of Ukraine. So if this is a burden to you like it is to me, then come to as many of these prayer meetings as you can and I love the timing of this because this Wednesday night is first Wednesday. So we're gonna gather in this room and I'm just gonna ask you to do something. If you've never come to first Wednesday, come this week. Just cancel, unless you're getting married or your children are getting married, <laughs> cancel it. I'm serious. Cancel what you're doing and let's pack this room Wednesday night uh, for worship and prayer. It's that important. It's that important for the church to come together and show strength. Uh, to the people of Ukraine. Can you imagine what they would give today if they had the freedom to gather? Do you think the pastors in the Ukraine would have to beg the people to come back to church today? No, they would flood the place if they had the opportunity. So let's listen as Americans, let's not lose our sense of gratitude for the privilege and the right that we have to come to gather and pray. So I'm just asking you to make Wednesday night a priority, okay? And if you uh, cancel everything else, Prayer is that important for us this week, all right? Turn in your Bible to Genesis 22. 
And we are in a series about, we're talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And for the last six or seven or eight weeks, we've talked about who is God the Father. And today, this Sunday is the last Sunday we're gonna talk about the Father, not, and we're gonna talk about him every Sunday, okay? But we're gonna specifically talk about him today. And then next Sunday, we're going to talk about the attributes, what, who is Jesus? Who was he? Who is he? And we're gonna talk and start that next Sunday. But I'm talking today about one of the big ideas of God the Father today. And I'm gonna to talk to you about the Father is a provider, a provider. Now, when I was growing up, my dad and Pam's dad, Stanley, my dad, Leland, Pam's dad, Stanley, whenever we were with them, Pam and I had these memories, even when we were a young married couple, anytime we were with our dads, we never had to buy anything. I mean, it was just, maybe it's a Southern thing, maybe it's a dad thing, but just when you're with your dad and he has his wallet, we never reached for our wallet because if we did, he would go, no, 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 you're not buying it. And there were times when Pam and I probably had more money than they did sometimes. And, but still, it was something in my dad, something in her dad that always wanted to buy. Now, I have paid it forward with my own two kids. In fact, I'm under the strong suspicion that the only reason I get invited anywhere <laughs> is because I'm going to buy. See, I thought it was because they wanted to be with dad, dad's funny, dad's cool. It's good to be with dad. I don't think any of that's true anymore. I think I have uncovered the lie that as long as dad has a wallet, dad gets invited. I think that's true. All right, so I don't know, I'm not trying to put stereotypes on men, but I do think there's something built into the dad psyche. There is something built into the man's psyche that we want as fathers, as husbands, to provide, to make sure that the home is cared for, to make sure that the people around us are cared for. I think it is built into the male psyche. And where do we get that? I think it comes directly from God the Father. And so I'm gonna tell you today three epic stories in the Hebrew Testament. These three stories you've heard before, and they are stories that if you grew up in church or maybe you've been in Sunday school or you're familiar with the Bible story, you're not gonna be shocked by these stories, you're gonna remember these stories. And I believe they're epic and I believe they're memorable and powerful because God wants to convince his children that he is indeed the ultimate provider for all that we need. Can somebody say amen? All right, so we're gonna start off this. I'm gonna, actually, this is not one of the, or this is one of the three stories, and it's the most famous camping trip in the history of the world. This is the story we're gonna start off. You think you've been on an epic camping trip? I'm about to tell you about the most epic camping trip in the history of the world. Now, turn with me to Genesis 22. I have verse nine up there. I should start with verse eight. Let me just tell you what verse eight says. So God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I want you to take Isaac, your only son, to the top of the mountain, take a big pile of firewood, and when you get to the top, I want you to sacrifice him. Now, stop just for a moment, I know. That's a crazy story, crazy story. The Bible is full of these, by the way, and if you don't have a Bible, I would love to give you one today because the Bible is full of these kinds of wild stories about God trying to show us something about his nature, okay? And sometimes God has to go to extravagant lengths to get our attention, and this is one of those stories. So verse eight says, now, <laughs> Isaac's no dummy. <laughs> Isaac's probably 16, 17, 18, maybe even 21, 22 years old. He's grown, he's mature. And Isaac is doing, he's, he's, a, he's looking at this whole process. He goes, dad, I don't mind going to the top of the mountain with you. I don't mind carrying the bundle of firewood to the top of the mountain, but there's one key ingredient missing here. There is no ram to sacrifice. So he's in his mind like, I'm going to the top of the mountain, but where is the sacrifice? Where are we gonna find it? He's thinking to himself, maybe I'm the sacrifice. So he has these suspicions. I don't know if you've ever gone on a camping trip wondering if you would come back. That comes from Isaac. Isaac was wondering, am I going to come back? Verse nine, 
when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. And he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Can we just stop for a moment? We all think that the hero of this story is Abraham. I think the hero of the story is Isaac. Abraham was gonna go back home. Isaac was a grown man who allowed his father to place him on wood. And Isaac had seen enough sacrifices to know that the thing on top of the wood is the sacrifice. So Isaac is there allowing his elderly father to go through this process. And so then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Now, before all of you think that God is this awful, evil beast, Abraham was surrounded. The place where Abraham was living at the time, all of the neighboring tribes around Abraham worshiped gods that required human sacrifice. But Abraham had known something about this Yahweh God. Abraham had, Abraham had discovered something about the nature of this God, which caused him to trust at a level that he could not trust the pagan gods. And while the pagan gods would have required the child sacrifice, Abraham knew in his heart that something was going to happen, that that was not the nature of this God, Yahweh. He says, and suddenly he raised his hands. He says, and God speaks now. This is the voice of God. Now I know that you fear God because you've not withheld from me your son, your only son. Stop just for a moment. This is the whole point of the message today. Where have we placed our hope and our confidence? Who do we believe is our ultimate source? And all Abraham wanted to know was, I gave you the gift of a son, but this son is not your source. Your family is not your source. I am still your source. And look, look at this. And the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. And of course, Abraham says, I'm right here. Here I am. He says, do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. And Abraham looked up and there in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. And he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Look at verse 14. So Abraham called that place from that day forward. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, say, say it last with me, it will be provided. So New Life Church, can we pray today? I'm gonna to ask you a question, and I'm gonna ask you this question again in about 25 minutes. Who is your source? Who do you really trust for what you need in your life? See, right now, the people of Ukraine, this is, they're going through the ultimate test of this right now. Who are they really trusting? because they can't trust government, they can't trust military necessarily, ultimately they have to put their hope in the Lord. The New Life Church, if you were ever brought to that place where you only could trust in God, would you have enough hope and enough trust in the Lord right now to say, God is my source? And what's being revealed in the Ukraine right now is really good discipleship. 15 years ago, a pastor probably stood in front of them with this message and said, if it comes down to a bad day in your life, if, it, if we're ever surrounded by our enemies, can we say in that moment, God is my source? The New Life Church, I'm gonna stand in front of you today as your pastor and ask you this question, is God your source? Can we ask and just pray that the Holy Spirit would reveal the answer to us? The Father, we're here today and we're reading these familiar stories, stories that we've heard hundreds of times in some cases. But Father, today I'm asking for a fresh, fresh revelation, not of the story, but of what is going on in our heart. I pray today that the, the layers of our heart would be peeled back, that you would see the core of what we believe and what we hope in and what we trust in. And I pray today at the end of this time together that we would all be able to say, you are our provider and you are enough. And we ask it in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen? Amen. So I'm gonna show you two more stories because there's two things that God, from the beginning of the Bible until the end of the Bible, has been trying to tell his people. 
And the first thing that God wants to show us and the first promise that he's made to all of us is that the Father will provide a way. The, in other words, the psalmist says he will lead us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So God has promised us that he will show you the next step to take. He will clear out a path in front of you. He will show you the steps to take in your life. So go with me to Exodus 13. Let me show you one more of these epic stories. Unbelievable story. So the people of Israel at this point have been, they were slaves in Egypt. They've been delivered. They've crossed the Red Sea. They are now on their way to the promised land. But the problem was they got lost and they had no GPS. They could only, they, they were using the stars and the sun and the moon. They were trying to figure out, but they got lost. And so God looks down and sees that his people are wandering around the desert. And it says by day, verse 21, by day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And at night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel, listen to this, by day or night, leave that up just for a moment. This is very important to catch. On your best day, when everything seems pretty good, when the kids are behaving, your husband doesn't come home, everything's going great. <laughs> I'd said that because the woman, I just, I was in Honduras a few weeks ago and the pastor said to me, two years ago, all the women in my church were coming to me and saying, pastor, would you please pray that our husbands would come home more often? He says, now that the pandemic is here, those same women are coming to me and saying, pastor, would you pray that our husbands would go away and go to work? <laughs> it doesn't matter what condition you find yourself in, right? It's never enough. Here's the point, on your best day, the Lord wants to guide you. And on the days where it seems dark and dangerous and unpredictable, the Lord wants to guide you. And the point of a cloud by day and a fire by night is God is saying, no matter what condition your life is in right now, I will guide you and lead you. I will show you the way. And then listen to this, it gets better. Verse 22, neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Now leave that up. I have been a, a believer almost 40 years. And do you know how long the people of God wandered in the, in, the, in the desert looking for the promised land? About 40 years. I have followed the Lord as long as they wandered in the desert. And I can tell you the same as they can tell you. For the last 40 years, when Pam and I have had perfect days, and in the last 40 years, when Pam and I have had dark days, the Lord has never failed to show up and lead us every single hour of every single day. I can say that with absolute confidence. For the last 40 years, the Lord has guided me. Here's what I believe. For the next 40 years, the Lord is going to guide me. This is his promise to us. Listen, when you choose to follow the Lord, he will lead you in the paths of righteousness he will lead you every second of the day. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to abandon you. He's not going to forsake you. Always he is with us. And we need to hear that today. Can somebody say amen to that? All right, here's the, that's the first promise he makes us. But it's one thing to say, hey, go there, walk that way and not give you what you need for the journey. So the second promise that he made the people of Israel, I will show you the way to go and I will give you what you need for the journey. He also provided for what they needed, not what they wanted. Now I wanna confess something to you. Yesterday, I watched a lot of college basketball. I, I really did. I got, there were so many good games on and I thought I'm just gonna watch this one game and then another game was on, and then another game was on, and then last night, right before the bed, there was a really good game on, so I watched a lot of basketball. But that's what I do on my days off sometimes. I like sports. So here's what I noticed, though. There were a lot of commercials on yesterday 
that told me I deserve things. And I, I was not aware of this. I deserve a good home loan, by the way. I didn't know that. I deserve white teeth. I did not know that. And I deserve better tasting dog food. And I don't even have a dog, but I deserve it. I did not real, realize that the Bill of Rights included home loans, white teeth, and dog food. But according to these experts that were on my television, they said, get the dog food you and your dog deserve. Have the white teeth you deserve. They never failed to mention that I should be taking care of the ones I already have. I can just simply replace these because I deserve them. And I did not realize that I deserved a really good home loan, but apparently my mortgage company has not told me that. Here's the point. All of the commercials are trying to create in you appetites that are not healthy. They're trying to tell you that you need something, you want something, and you should have it, right? Here's the promise that the Lord gives us. He didn't say he would give us what we wanted. He said he would give us what we needed. So let me show you this. Now skip ahead to Exodus 16. So we go from Genesis 22. The story continues. They're still in the desert, okay? Still in the desert. Exodus 16, verse 14. When the dew was gone, they walk out of their tents and on the ground, thin flakes like frost were on the ground. This is why I believe this is where frosted flakes were invented. God gave us frosted flakes. So if you're eating frosted flakes in the morning, you're in the biblical narrative, okay? You're just participating with the Lord. He says, you've never seen this before, have you? Flakes like frost were on the ground and they were on the desert floor. And when the Israelites saw it, they said, this is good stuff. They said, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, listen to this, this is so important. It's the bread the Lord has given you to eat. The bread is a basic thing. It's a basic part of your diet, but this was from the Lord. And so the Lord then gives them this. The Lord commanded them, each one is to gather as much as he wants. It's not, it's not what he says. Gather as much as you need. So take an omer. Now an omer is like a quart jar. Think about a quart jar about this big. He says, take a, a quart jar, an omer, for each person you have in your tent. So you had, if you had eight kids, a husband and a wife, that's 10 quart jars. If you were three or four quart jars, three or four quart jars. So can imagine every morning you get up, you take your quart jars, you go out of your tent, you fill those quart jars with that amount. And listen, this is one of the most miraculous statements in all the Bible. The Israelites did as they were told. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that's one of the few times they actually did what they were told. But listen, you don't mess around with breakfast, all right? I'm not gonna disobey when breakfast is involved. And so they were obedient. They went out and they gathered much. Some gathered a lot because they were greedy or maybe they were big, I don't know. Maybe they're tall people, maybe they didn't need more. Some gathered little, but when they measured it by the quart, he who gathered much did not have too much. And he who gathered little did not have too little. Each one gathered as much as he needed. Now think about this. Who, who was it that told them to leave Egypt and to go to the promised land? God the Father. Who told them to, to follow the cloud by day and the fire by night? God the Father. So if God the Father tells you to do something and God the Father points out a path for you to follow, here's what I can tell you is an absolute guarantee from the scriptures. If you're following the path that God has put you on, God will provide. Here's what I believe about the church in the Ukraine. And this is why Pastor Brad said what he said a moment ago. Right now, the church in the Ukraine don't have enough. Most of us in this room have more than we need. Therefore, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to look for some trusted organizations that can take what we have and we're going to put it in their hands and they're going to have what they need. 
And so while Putin and the, 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 the people who are, they think they're harming them, what the church is going to prove through the blessings of the Lord is what the enemy meant for harm is simply gonna mobilize the global church. All it's gonna do is cause the global church to awaken. Every time the enemy strikes at one member of the body, the rest of the body responds. This is what makes the church so powerful. And that's why we as a church call each other brothers and sisters. For 2000 years in the church, we've called each other brothers and sisters because when brother is in need, sister rises up. When sister is in need, the brother rises up and there's always enough for the body of Christ. And look, notice about this story. They had to go and gather the bread. Listen, oftentimes you're asking God for a miracle when God's asking for your participation. You gotta, you gotta leave your tent. The tent, listen, you know what the tent represented in this story? Your place of warmth and comfort. Your place of safety, warmth, comfort and rest. He said, I'm not gonna put, it. God could have very easily said, when you wake up in the morning, just look over in the tent, corner of your tent and there'll be an Omer jar filled with frosted flakes. That's not what he said. You're going to have to get out of your place of comfort, warmth, and safety. You're gonna have to pull back the tent flap. You're gonna have to walk out into the place of the cold and the danger and gather what I have given you. Are you catching this today? That they had to go and gather the bread. And the reason they would go and gather the bread, the bread was from God. But the bread only lasted for one day. Now, I'm gonna show you this because there's a parallel passage in the New Testament that I wanna show you something today, okay? Matthew chapter six, Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray because they ask him, Jesus, would you teach us to pray the way you pray? All right, let's do this. This, is, this then, Jesus says, is how you should pray. Let's pray it together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Verse 11, let's read it out loud together. Give us today our daily bread. Now I'll leave that up for a moment because I have always been aggravated by this particular gr grammatical exchange here. I don't know if you know this, but I, I was an English teacher in high school. I know it's not apparent by listening to my language sometimes, but I actually taught high school English for four years. And one of the things that drove me crazy about high school students is their overuse of the language. Concise, be concise, be clear. To me, this is not concise or clear. If I were writing this passage of scripture, I would have said, give us today. In other words, it feels redundant. Give us today our daily bread. I would have said, give us bread today. Give us bread today. Put that up, please. Go ahead, put it up. One more. One more. One more. Why not? Come on, put up. hit that button. Why not? Why not give us bread today? That, that's not it. We may, I think the computer crashed back there. All right, here we go. Yes. No, it's, it's up over here, but it's not over here. There we go. Give us bread today. And come to the prayer meetings, by the way, in case you've forgotten. In case you've forgotten about that. <laughs> Bless their heart. They're under such pressure back there. Can we just give them a hand one more time for even, even attempting? <laughs> if they can keep up with my ADD, they should get like a gold badge in heaven, all right? Why not say this? Give us bread today. That would have been a clearer, more concise way to say that prayer. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus was actually using Exodus language in the Lord's Prayer. Because today refers to when and daily refers to an amount. Give us today our daily bread is saying two different things that we all need to catch. The word today means a timing, when you need it. Daily refers to that Omer jar, how much you need, not what you want, but how much you need. Here's what I want you to catch from this whole thing today. God knows when we need things and how much we need. 
And listen, this is why every time from now on when you pray the Lord's Prayer, when you get to that particular line, if you've been doubting whether or not God knows you and sees you, maybe you've doubted whether or not God can stretch out his hands over 7, 000, 7 billion human lives and have everything come into order. God says, I have the ability to stretch out my hand over seven billion human lives, and I know when you need it, I know how much you need it, take a deep breath. I am the one that started you on this path. I am the one that told you where to go. I would not tell you to go somewhere if I did not provide you for the journey. And some of you need to hear that today. You've, been, you've not doubted the path that God's put you on but you're doubting whether or not he will provide for you. If God did not put you on the path, you have to provide for yourself. But if God put you on the path that you're on right now, he, by his own promises, is guaranteed to provide what you need. That's, that's absolute truth. Here's the, here's the pivot point though, okay? Here's, here's the only requirement. God has only one requirement for those two promises. Two promises, one requirement. The Father wants to be our only source. That's the only thing he's asking. So we just read Exodus 16, Genesis 22, where all these promises that he's made. Look now at Exodus 20, verse three. This is the very first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment that makes all the others possible. Because you can't follow the other nine commandments unless you get commandment number one correct. No other God before me. So Moses and Abraham, all of them, they were living in a polytheistic world. There was a God for everything. There was a God for war, a God for food, a God for the crops, a God for water. There were hundreds if not thousands of gods. And God says something remarkable. Yahweh God says, I actually wanna be the only God for everything. And by the way, he's not tempting us. God does not tempt us, but he does test us with this. I can tell you right now, I've, I've, I've met with pastors from Kiev. Uh, I've met with them. When I was in the Odessa, I was in Odessa, Ukraine about 20 years ago, this pastor from Kiev came down and met with me. Really, think about five-star Roman or a Russian general, he was the senior pastor of this church, big guy, brown, gray hair, about six foot five with a thick Russian accent. And he said to me, this is what he said to me. I, it was 20 years ago and I, I remember the restaurant I was sitting in and the bad borscht I was eating and how homesick I was. And he looked at me and he said, pastor, it must be really hard to lead people in the United States. I said, why? He goes. He says, you have so much stuff. And what he was saying was, it must be hard for God to be the primary source when there are so many other sources you can pick from. And they were just coming out of their independent struggle. And they were a very poor country. He says, listen, let me tell you about my church in Kiev. He says, we only have one source. We have one source. And what Abraham and Moses knew about the other gods around them is that the other gods required a sacrifice. And so when Abraham was taking Isaac up to the top of the mountain, he knew what the other gods around him would have required. They would have required the sacrifice. Abraham knew that Yahweh God was not going to do that. And what happened when Jesus came to the earth Jesus came and turned the formula upside down because our God now becomes the sacrifice. Listen, you don't have to sacrifice something before God to get him to act on your behalf. The sacrifice, the final sacrifice has already been made. All that we have to do now is believe and to hope and to trust and to ask and to, and to, and to put our faith in that final sacrifice. And this is why we come to the table of the Lord. I want you to think about the absurdity of this. On the night that he was betrayed, when all of hell was about to break loose on the earth, and, and that's a literal statement, all of hell was about to descend upon the earth. Darkness and earthquakes, the son of God was about to be killed. That is, that is the quintessential definition of hell coming to the earth. 
on that night, I believe Jesus should have been teaching them military maneuvers, how to use a weapon, how to hide, how to forage for food, how to survive, how to stand up to their enemies. That's not what he did. He sat down at a Passover meal and he ate with them because Jesus wanted a meal to be the thing that we remembered about him. Why? Why did he want a meal to be the thing that we remembered? Because in John chapter six, he told them, I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here's the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, something eternal happens in your heart and soul. When you hope and trust and put your faith in Jesus, he says he will live forever. In other words, death does not have the final word over you. Death is not the final victor and does not have the final word. Death, hell, and the grave comes under the authority of Jesus and we have a different hope, a different, a different passion, a different life when you say yes to Jesus because we've eaten of a different bread. New Life Church, listen, when we come to the table of the Lord, this meal that we're about to take, and by the way, it's awful. The bread's awful. The juice is barely palatable. It's, it's, it's hard to open, and I like all of that. I'll tell you why. Because I believe Jesus takes the most ordinary, mundane, tasteless things in our life, and he breathes life on them. In, in other words, this meal was never meant to be extravagant. It was meant to be common. It was meant to be daily, something you would eat every day, daily bread that gives us daily strength. And this meal that we're about to take reminds us that Jesus is our provider and he's made the sacrifice to be our provision. Would you stand up with me this morning? Stand up together with me. I wanna pray over you. I asked you a question about 25 minutes ago. And I believe the Holy Spirit is, I mean, just for myself, if no one else needed this message, I needed to hear the message today. Because I'm, I'm at a stage in my life where I have options. I have other things I can depend on. And I'm here today to tell you as your pastor, I started with an absolute allegiance on Jesus and Jesus alone. And I'm going to finish with an absolute allegiance to Jesus and Jesus alone. Jesus was enough when I started on this path and Jesus is enough right now. And New Life Church, would you just close your eyes and lift your hands toward the Lord. In just a moment, we're gonna come and take the bread and take the cup. Maybe you're watching online and maybe you're sitting in the room today. Is Jesus, is the Father your source? Is he all that you need? Have you looked to other things to provide what God himself can only provide? That's a big question. Are you looking for government or economies or jobs to provide something for you that in the end only God can give us? So Father, today we, do, we confess that we've turned our eyes away to worthless idols and we have chosen to worship things that cannot bring life to us. We confess that today and we thank you that you've already chosen to forgive us and we receive grace. We don't receive condemnation for that. We receive grace, but we confess it out loud because it's important to confess it out loud. But Father, today we thank you that we will have, we make a choice today to have no other God before us. You are enough. Christ is enough. His resurrection, his death, his everything, his ascension into heaven is proof to us that he is enough. So Father, today I pray, we pray now for the beautiful people in the Ukraine. As this truth is being tested today, I pray you'd give them strength. Fill them with hope and faith today. I pray you would surround them. I pray for a thick presence of the Holy Spirit 
wherever those believers are, I just pray they would feel overwhelmed. I know it's coming up on nighttime and their bedtime tonight. It's about 10 o'clock in the Ukraine right now. But Lord, I thank you as they lay their heads down to sleep tonight and bombs are bursting all around them. I pray that the sweet, powerful presence of the Holy Spirit would overshadow them and give them rest and strength and comfort tonight. I pray their children would lie down in safety and rise up in strength. And I pray that you, oh God, would be glorified, that you would push back the oppressors and reestablish justice in that country. And Lord, we declare here in Colorado Springs that Christ is King. You are Lord and you are enough. So I pray today as we sing this song, as we prepare our hearts to come to the table of the Lord, that you would remind us of that as we sing. In Jesus' name. Let's sing this song and then we'll come into the table of the Lord.
Go ahead and grab your communion elements as we get ready to receive from the Lord. As we come to this table, our hearts are filled with joy because we're coming to the table of salvation where God reminds us that he's not a God that's looking to us to make some sacrifice to get his attention, but rather he's the God who he himself became the sacrifice for us. <sighs> what amazing news that fills our hearts with love and hope and joy that God's intervening on our behalf that there was a bread that came to our forefathers in the desert, but they still died. But he's offering us a bread, the bread of his body, his own blood, that whoever, anyone who partakes of this will never die. And I love that Jesus used that word, anyone, because sometimes we come to the table of salvation and we go, me? Uh, God, I, I see this gift, but you know what's behind me? It's in my past. You know what I've done? Maybe this, maybe this table's not for me. Maybe I, I can't come to this table. And Jesus steps right into our space, grabs our face and looks into our eyes and said, I died for you. I died for you. I died for you come receive let me show you what it looks like to live where I'm your source where I'm your sustainer where I'm everything and on the night not some ordinary night but on the very night Jesus was betrayed he took the bread and when he blessed it he broke it you can break that little foam wafer in your hands he said this is my body given for you do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. And in the same way after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant, the new commitment that he's making with us. And he's making it in his own blood. And he said, whenever you do this, partake of it in remembrance of what I've done for you. Let's take the cup together. Let's sing together, church, and celebrate the fact that he's our source and our sustainer today and forevermore. Church, can we just thank the Lord, give him a clap, a shout for what he's done today? God is so good. He's so good to us. I want to invite our prayer, our team forward, our ministry team forward. There's going to be pastors and leaders up here. Maybe today, as Brady was opening God's word, talking to us about God being our only source, that you today for the first time said, God, I, I'm giving up on all this striving all this chasing after other things, and I want you to be my source. Maybe you made that decision today. 
We'd love to know about it. We'd love to pray for you. Also, if you're new in the last few weeks or today, there's a spot right out here in our lobby. If you go out this these center door is a little to the left. It's Connect Center. You can see a big sign. That's where you can learn about next steps, about how to get involved here at our church. What, what beyond just attending Sunday can you be involved in? There's so much, right, happening this next week. We've got first Wednesdays. We've got how many prayer meetings? Eight or something like that? It's crazy. Um, jump in the middle with us. It's going to be a fantastic week. Church, can you open your hands? I want a prayer, a prayer of blessing over you as you leave. New Life Church, family of God in North Colorado Springs, may you know that God is your source, that God is your provider, that he is your sustainer, that he will not leave you or forsake you, that he's gonna fill you to overflowing in your workplaces, in your schools, in your neighborhoods, so that you can be the light of the world and reflect who he is to those around you. I bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Church, go in peace. See you Wednesday, if not sooner.